We are having tough conversations about race. People want to understand and learn how to create change. But conversation is just that. It's talking. And while that's insightful, action is powerful. Racism speaks to a system of disproportionate opportunities. Policies and practices were created to stop Black people and people of color from achieving upward economic and social mobility. First, we have to dismantle systemic racism. It is pervasive and touches every area of our lives. From business, incarceration, and government, to housing, banking, and healthcare. Let's talk to a couple of folks in the technology industry. So we have two people here with us today, and I'm gonna allow them to introduce themselves. Thank you, Risha, thank you for having me. My name is Obum Ukabam. I am the head of admissions and marketing manager for Ho the Hoberton School Tulsa, which is a two-year software engineering school. Hmm. Great, and then we have Michelle. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Mungalon, Senior Manager of Talent and Culture at Samsung in North America. Thank, both, thank, thank you to both of you uh, for being here today. Now, the tech industry gets a lot of heat when it comes to diversity, and it has been for many years. You know, you watch the numbers come out and the percentages are so low uh, regarding mm -hmm. diversity. First and foremost, how can we how can we get better representation? Um, Michelle, what's some of the things that maybe you guys are doing at Samsung? Um, you know, it's a real growing process for us. And I think the toughest thing for us is being a Korean company that's operating in the United States. And there is a lot of choice out there on who you can work for. So it's um, really, really difficult. It's very competitive. Uh, some of the things that we've been trying to do is really focus on diversity and inclusion initiatives, really supporting and embracing ERGs that are organically growing in our organization, taking a look at some tools and practices that we have from a hiring perspective uh, to try and increase some of our percentages to have a little bit more of a diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's, it's a growing learning process and we're constantly evolving. Thanks, and I would like to ask you, Abum, um, what does systemic racism in the tech industry look like? Mm. Um, it, yes, uh, thank you. It has many faces. Um, we can we can speak about systemic racism, and even and how techno what technology is used for. We could talk about systemic racism in the workplace. And so when you when you talk about systemic racism and the, the kind of technology that we're using in, in today's society, we see it in our social media. We see it in our uh, face recognition technology. We see it everywhere because um, if we have algorithms and, and all mm -hmm. these things that are used to help us, you know, uh, fight crime, for instance, and, and if it's bias, if it's, if it's biased against people of color, black people or Latinx communities, it's, 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 uh, it's really, like you said, the system is working, but it's, it's not good. It's messing up a lot of uh, people's lives. So when you look at uh, that, you have to also look at technology in the workplace. You've talked yeah. about how Silicon Valley is, it's, it's, it's very white. Mm -hmm. uh, very white male dominated and uh, if anything you have white males and you have a lot of Asians but you don't have a lot of Latin, Latinx mm -hmm. people black people and why is that is because they have this thing they call culture fit in Silicon Valley so even when you're being um, interviewed you're they're asking you are you a, are you good fit in our culture well right. if your culture is predominantly white males of course I'm not gonna you know I might not jump out as a, a, a fit to be in your culture because you're, ask, you're not asking me if I fit well with the, uh, the job that I'm doing. You're asking me if I'm going to fit well with my colleagues. And if they're all white men, um, that's not fair to me because you're asking me questions like, do I like Radiohead? I mean, I like that band. I mean, I, like, I may like Usher, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to do my job well. It doesn't mean I'm not as skilled in technology. So I think systemic racism has many faces in technology, and it's very detrimental to our society because technology is running the world right now. Exactly, exactly. And Michelle, being from such a large company, is that, uh, is that something that you guys are facing? And when you talk about AI and you talk about bias and, and technology, is that something that, um, that you're facing from uh, from your role or within Samsung? 
I think for uh, for us, it's really important to utilize some of the te- some of the technology that already exists, and how can we internalize it with some of the processes that we have. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, AI is so fascinating to me, and uh, I have a lot to learn in that particular space. But utilizing technology for, you know, let's say gender neutral language in your job descriptions Mm -hmm. so that you're able to attract uh, specific talent, skilled talent into your organization, I think is really key. Um, It's a lot of things that we haven't been able to maximize on in the past Mm -hmm. in from an HR perspective. We never had that technology where you can think about masculine words or feminine words Mm -hmm. or negative words or positive words. So um, our specific area is really evolving and at a rapid pace, especially Mm -hmm. when you're in the high tech industry, I think is really important. But there's also little things that you could also do in terms of, you know, removing the person's name um, in the resume so that uh, you give more of an unconscious bias is like off the table and really giving the candidate an opportunity to uh, stand out and um, be present during the process, the hiring process. So there's... um, also things you could do without the use of technology, I think, as, as well, uh, to help increase the diversity in your, in your organization. Right. And let's talk about hiring a little bit. One of the things that I hear a lot that I find extremely frustrating is when we start talking about hiring, you will hear people say, we have to find the most qualified candidates. And <laughs> it drives me crazy, but I would love to know how Uh, how both of you hear that and what we can do to start moving people away from the thought process that diverse candidates are not the most qualified. Hmm. Whoever wants to take that. Well, yeah, I mean, I could speak on a little bit of that. Um, When we say we have to have the most qualified again, it goes back to what their culture's already set upon. So when we look at the software engineering industry, for instance, we think, we think of a software engineer, we think of these tech guys, you think of a white male. Mm-hmm. So to, to everybody else, even black people, to even brown people, we think of uh, technology as white male. So we have imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. So we struggle with ourselves feeling qualified, let alone the people who are hiring us thinking we're qualified. So that is the reason we have a lot of imposter syndrome. We, 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 we make these heroes. We make Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg he's our hero. We, we, we amplify these uh, white male as the saviors of technology. So we already don't feel like we belong at the table. Mm-hmm. And, they're in the, and with these messages and, with, and with, with the systems that are in place right now, it, it, it's, it's kind of like the crab in the barrel, crabs in the barrel effect where we're just struggling to get anything, right? We're fighting each other to get anything. And the fact remains that if this system is continues to just amplify a white males, we will never be able to feel qualified. It will, they would never feel that we are qualified, even though we are. So mm-hmm. what we need to do is um, I know there's a uh, biases. We're supposed to have blind uh, bias in hiring, uh, hiring, right? We should mm-hmm. take the names out. That's all good too. But I also want to advocate. We need to now amplify black voices, amplify black. So now we need to intentionally higher black and brown people, they are qualified, right? We don't have to have this notion that, well, well, we're just hiring them to fit. No, we have a lot of qualified people. Is where you're looking is it may be your issue. If you're only going to Stanford and MIT, which already has their own systemic issues, right, of, of recruiting people, then you need to go to HBCUs. You need to mm-hmm. intentionally find those black, the black talent that's there already. You need to do that instead of just making excuses that there's not, they're not qualified. Where, where the places you're looking do not give us a chance to be qualified. Exactly. You brought I up- just wanted to, I wanted to add to that. Um, you know, the beautiful thing about this conversation is the diversity of thought. So I absolutely agree with everything that you're saying. But in addition to that, for me, when I think about hiring the most qualified candidate, it also means look, for us, we got to not only look at consumer electronics industry, so we need to kind of look outside. We don't necessarily also have to look at Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. We should be able to look at different states or different provinces for the the people that are qualified for the job. So I just wanted to add that uh, caveat in as well, in addition to everything that you said, because that 
it also broadens your opportunity to kind of look for the right talent. Right. And, and how do we as companies move forward based on quotas? Because what I'm getting from a lot of people is, well, now all things being considered equal, if companies are focused on diversity and say there's a person of color applying for a job and a white person and all things are considered equal, it's going to go to the diverse person now because we're doing diversity. What are your thoughts on that? (laughs) (laughs) Judging by that laugh, we'll we'll let Michelle go first. (laughs) Um. We have a very different philosophy. I think uh, we try not to actually have quotas in our organization as we're trying to, um, it's a journey, right? So it's not, this is not a sprint. So we've intentionally not had any KPIs, have not had any quotas to having a diverse workforce because it's really difficult to be honest. If I think about how many are there that are women engineers anyway? So am I really going to be able to achieve that specific quota, especially in the high tech industry, when other people are trying to be just as diverse when it comes to gender specific uh, perspectives? So it's a very difficult question to answer just because um, there's just not enough people in general to go around, um, let alone having a diverse candidate. Okay. Agreed. Obum? Yeah, I was going to say, agree. There, there's already a shortage in talent in the tech industry already. So you, 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 you match that with diverse candidates. It's not, it's, it's not easy to find. But at the same time, I would say this, the people who worry about quotas and all this, you know, affirmative action, if you want to call it. Um, there was, even in the 90s, there was this big, big deal about affirmative action, how it's going to be. We're still in the same, we're even worse than we were before. Um, what we've been doing already hasn't worked. Mm-hmm. So if that means that the, you're hiring more black candidates and you feel it, it feels unfair, well, let's let's try it. Let's 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 try that because yeah. what we're doing right now is not working. And black people, brown people, were they're not being hired anyway. So if you have to hire them, it's it's going to work out for you in your favor. Trust mm-hmm. me. It, we've seen that historically. Mm-hmm. We are very creative. We you know. Black and brown people, indigenous people, women, we're, we're the best of the best. I will say that. I would, I would challenge you, white men, that we, we, we can come in and knock the walls down, knock the doors down and do, and do a better job. You know, I'll, I'll even say that. We can do a better job. So if that means that you have to, without tokenizing us, having to, having to hire more, more diverse candidates, do it because it's not working right now. So what do you have to lose? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. And you know, I mean, I'm I'm all for having a diverse workforce, obviously, for the nature of my role. And we want to be able to have that diversity of thought. People have different experiences and different educational backgrounds and, and all of that for sure. But I think the other piece too, that if you had to take a look at, you know, in all things equal, you have two very strong candidates that are vying for a specific role. Because diversity and inclusion is such a hot topic at the moment. Um, sense of belonging in organization is also very key. You need to start taking a look at which is the candidate that is going to have the same set of values that, you know, their personal beliefs, the company beliefs, are they going to um, have that sense of belonging in the organization? Because it's great to hire someone, but if they're not, we're not going to be able to retain them because mm-hmm. they don't feel like they belong in our organization. It's just not a fit for them then um, it's also very difficult. So I think, you know, when you get to a point where they're both really skilled, you need to start also taking a look at your organization. Um, are the values the same? And also taking a look at your team. So if I have a very strong team already and I want to make my team a little bit better, which candidate is going to round out my team? Which mm-hmm. is the person that's going to give me what I don't already have? to make my team better. And I think uh, those are some of the things that we could continue to do to make it objective. And I like that. And I think if we can lead from an inclusive mind, then that works great because then we're thinking about too what that person can add to the team. But I I think sometimes what happens is depending on who's in charge charge of the team, if they look at that person and say, oh, this person doesn't fit because of, 
you know, some, some diverse characteristics or something about them that makes me uncomfortable is where we're getting into the issues. You know, I think we have got to, as, as companies, start leading inclusively and in thinking about what, what people can offer, even if they're, even if they don't line up exactly because what they bring may just be what you need. Right. So I want to, um, I know we're almost out of time here. So, you know, one of the great things about this is we are having conversations. We are um, empowering people and enlightening people with information, but conversation is just that. It's conversation. What happens after the conversation? I want to ask both of you for, you know, a quick recommendation for what we can do to move away from systemic racism, to dismantle the systems that are uh, creating inequity for a lot of people. Michelle, would you like to take it first? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's really difficult for tech organizations as well, because if you don't have um, the changes happening in government, in the criminal justice system, in our societies that we live in, it's so difficult to sustain some of the changes mm -hmm. that organizations and companies do. Um, one of the great things that we've been going through lately, this month, I've gone through so many meetings with our ERGs as an example, from you know our Galaxy of Black Professionals to our Equality Alliance to our Next Generation Leaders. But I think it's important that you know for allies that we continue to listen, learn, educate ourselves. Don't be scared to ask questions if you're not certain about something mm -hmm. just for clarification. And then see what are some of the things that we can do to really not just say I'm an ally, but really do something to impact change. And luckily, with all the horrible things that have been happening in America, you know, our younger generation is giving me so much hope just for the things that they're doing. They've just, they're done, you know? Yeah. And um, I think with all of that, com they're coming together, the solidarity is there. It's really forcing organizations and companies to take action. And silence is not an option anymore because our younger generation is just not having it. Right. Right. Thank you. Obum, what are your thoughts? Definitely agree. Our younger generation is not having it. So, and that's who you need to really be focusing on. They're the ones who are going to run the world and, and, and technology is helping, helping them, you know, become, they need to become one because you see smartphones are, 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 are is, is a huge thing right now. We're using to fight um, in these injustices. So we now we're being able to tape injustices and people are able to see it now. Things that I used to grow up having to deal with myself um, growing up in Ferguson, Florissant, Missouri, the things, if, if I could have had a smartphone back then, people would be so astonished and, and shocked and, and amazed at what we had to go through. Now we can see it, right? So mm -hmm. we have these smartphones, we have social media to amplify, you know, to, to, for people to even have rallies, to gather together across the nation we're, we're using social media. So what I would say to help fight systemic racism is to not just be diverse, inclusive in, in, in the people, it's, all the, it's also your system, your algorithms, right? That's the big thing about technology is these algorithms. So we have this, we have this notion now of uh, fighting algorithm bias and you know, facial recognition, but we need to also have algorithm equality. We also, mm -hmm. we, we see that we use algorithms and credit card, a credit, credit monitoring and, and, sh and showing that a person of color is a risk. And we need to fix those systems. We need to fix it because, and, and use it instead to, uh, I said earlier, amplify black voices, amplify black investors, you know, black candidates. Uh, technology, having black people in technology is not new. Um, they want to act like it's something that we can look forward to. No, 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 no. Listen, we, black people have been inventing things for years that make your life easier. It wasn't just peanut butter. It was um, even the filament and light bulb was from a black person, even though we say, you know, Thomas Edison and Benjamin Franklin, all people, a black man did that. Um, the doors open up an elevator. We did that, you know? So even with technology, you see with um, video cartridges, different tech, you know, there's a lot of different technology that black people a long time ago were involved in. So technology knows that and they need to stop hiding behind the fact that they're, we, they have to find qualified candidates now and try to find, they know we're there. They know we're here. And I, I work for a school that um, the founders 
are see, they see that. They said, we need to find a, a system that allows people to become software engineers because right now all we see is white men. And they're mm -hmm. two white men from France. And say so they saw that themselves. So they have removed barriers like uh, upfront tuition, um, uh, credit, GPA, mm -hmm. all these things, a criminal background. So I'm, I'm proud to work for a school in Holberton that is looking to break those barriers and, and, and let women and, and have um, um, indigenous people, veterans, black and brown people mm -hmm. become software engineers because to change all this, we got to change the pipeline. It has to start from mm -hmm. the access, right? We can't just say, here's qualified great candidates if nobody's having a chance. So I said a lot of things, but just to bring it back, Risha, I just want to say we have a lot of work to do, not just in our hiring, in our actual system itself. The technology we have itself needs to be changed. Absolutely. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. you said something, though, that sparked another question for me uh, really quick. You talked about them removing the barriers to payments and different things like that. What are your thoughts on, because I've been in conversations and with professional organizations, and they will say, hey, we need to lower our prices so that we can get people of color in here. And these are professional organizations. And it always, frankly, rubs me the wrong way because I know that there are dollars in diverse communities. A mm -hmm. lot trillions of dollars in diverse communities. Oh, yeah. So I, I think that's a, a, a fallback for certain uh, for certain institutions to say, well, yeah, we want to be diverse, but we can't lower our prices. And that's 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 a myth. But I heard you say that, and so it just it, it made me think about that. What are what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I I too personally hate when people discuss black issues and all they say is, well, look what we're doing for the poor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's something, again, that's just, that's another issue of what they want to, you know, perpetuate black people to be. But yeah, it's definitely something that um, we're not just, but at the same time, again, we're talking about systemic racism. So that a lot mm -hmm. of things have to do, a lot of people who are in those situations because of systemic racism, because of the, you know, things outside of technology. So yes, mm -hmm. we have to make sure we include things like funding and, and but you like you said there's a lot of black um venture capitalists that don't have the backing from big companies i think the biggest uh venture company back in silicon valley at, at one point in 2019 did not have a single black uh vc mm. they didn't back they weren't backing and now they're saying to i think with the whole george floyd incident oh you know we need to listen to you guys what do we need to do because people challenged them they said you guys are not backing any black venture capitalists mm -hmm. uh these uh black firms that are putting their money where their mouth is. Mm -hmm. So if, the, if it's not coming from the top, um, even the people we do have, if, if they're not being supported from the top, we'll never see that. So that's why we challenge you to open your doors, whether it be through finance, even though we're not a monolith and we're not just a poor people that need help with money. We, we, no, we have money as well, but we need to make sure from the top down because at the top of that 1%, we are not there. Black people, no matter what, we are not there. Brown people, we are not there. So we, yes, we do have to open up financially. We have to, um, without creating this image that we're just poor and charity, uh, we need charity. We also need to realize that that 1% of controlling the wealth doesn't look like us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you to both of you for doing this with me. Um, it was great dialogue and I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank Definitely. You for having us. Really appreciate <laughs> but, it. Can't wait to meet you in person, Oboom. And Michelle, I can't wait to see you again either. Always a pleasure. <laughs> All right. Everybody Thank have a great guys. rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. You Thanks. too. Stay safe. Both Michelle and Oboom gave you their recommendations for what to do after the conversation. I would add that we start taking serious looks at equitable practices. We have to be as interested and as serious about equity at work as we are about diversity and inclusion. This is Risha Grant with Two Works For You. Mm -hmm.